how many Jedi really survived Order 66. The Great Jedi Purge and the Siege of Nightfall largely eradicated the Jedi Order as it was known, slashing their numbers by the thousands in one fell swoop. During the Clone Wars, there were an estimated 10,000 Jedi Knights patrolling the galaxy as Keepers of Peace and Generals, Paragons of Light, or so they thought. After the Jedi Purge began, however, the number was dwindled down by upwards of 99% of the overall order. Where 10,000 Knights once were there, now only a fraction. Statistically, this would leave roughly 100 Jedi Knights alive following the rise of the Empire, but this number has never been officially verified. Though Vader and his Imperial forces would continue hunting down a significant number of these survivors, as well as throughout the Imperial Age, doesn't survive the initial onslaught and many Jedi lived for years beyond the Order's execution. Many perished under the shadow of the Empire, some survived to see it fall, and many collaborated with one another. 100 Jedi were believed to have survived Order 66, but today we have found 114. Now, students of the Force, welcome to today's Holocron, and let's identify as many Order 66 survivors as we could find figure out how long they each survived, and talk a little bit about each of these survivors. There are a few things that we need to clarify though before we begin. First, this list does swing between canon and legends continuity, so it's possible some of these survivors may no longer be official canon. It's also possible that there are Jedi survivors who have yet to be revealed who we do not know of yet. Finally, we are only counting Jedi who were in an active or former part of the Jedi Order during the Age of the Republic, and we will not be counting any Jedi who took up their training after the Republic fell. Therefore, Jedi like Luke and Ezra, for example, will not be counted since they did not train with the Republic Jedi. Some characters, however, like Ahsoka and Dagan Gera, were former members of the Order who left or retired before Order 66, and these characters will be counted. So now, let's begin with getting some of the most obvious ones out of the way. Perhaps the two most iconic survivors of the Order are Obi-Wan Kenobi and Grandmaster Yoda, and their journeys following the destruction of the Republic are arguably the most well-documented of any Jedi. We got to see how each of these Jedi survived Order 66 and Revenge of the Sith, on Utapau and Kashyyyk respectively, and later how the Jedi were able to train Luke Skywalker to knighthood, thus ultimately leading to the downfall of the Empire and the redemption of Anakin Skywalker. Living out much of their remaining lives on Tatooine and Dagobah respectively, they seldom showed their Jedi nature to anyone, ensuring that they remained hidden until Luke and Leia matured. The next most influential Jedi survivor is arguably Ahsoka Tano, who survived her attackers following the Siege of Mandalore. Ahsoka survived due to Anakin's intense training regimen which was showcased in Tales of the Jedi. Ahsoka was able to fight off her clones more effectively than most Jedi, free Rex from his inhibitor chip, and escape before ultimately joining the ranks of the Rebel Alliance as Fulcrum. Once the dust settled and the Jedi were driven to ground, she found her new home on the world of Thabeska, located on the Outer Rim for the duration of the following year. Ahsoka, now going by the name Ashla, lived a relatively quiet life on the remote world, but on the first anniversary of the rise of the Empire, Ahsoka felt the winds begin to change yet again, and she was eventually driven off the world. Throughout her late teens, Ahsoka skipped around from planet to planet, making allies and showing small signs of resistance to the Empire, never staying in one place for too long until she was eventually reunited with Bail Organa of Alderaan in 18 BBY, just before her 19th birthday. Bail offered her a place among the earliest founders of the Rebellion, and she began conducting missions for the Rebel Alliance officially. During the height of the Empire, Ahsoka worked closely with fellow Order 66 survivor Kanan Jarrus and the Rebel Squadron known as the Ghost Crew. Kanan, who previously went by the name Caleb Doom, was a Padawan under Master Depa Balava when Order 66 was issued, and Caleb only survived due to the intervention of the Bad Batch. Caleb, now Kanan, grew up under a new name in hiding, but was much more open about his Jedi nature after embracing the young Ezra as his Padawan. He and Ezra both brandished their lightsabers on several occasions, and Kanan became unafraid to show off his force prowess when pushed to a last resort. Kanan found a new sense of purpose and promise after taking on the young Ezra Bridger. After joining together, the two fought side by side as Jedi Knights in a new era where they were ferociously hunted by Inquisitors and later Lord Vader. 
One significant arc between the two Jedi saw them infiltrating an Imperial prison known as the Spire, hoping to free former Jedi Master Luminara Unduli, who they believed had been taken captive by the Empire. While they would ultimately uncover the horrifying sight of Unduli's body, which had been used by the Imperials as bait to lure in prospective Jedi rescuers, Luminara did in fact survive the initial Order 66 attack. Luminara was also on Kashyyyk when the Order commenced, and Unduli was able to survive the onslaught of her clone forces, but was eventually taken into official custody by the Empire, one of the few Jedi that were not killed on sight. After being taken prisoner, Unduli survived as live bait for an unspecified amount of time. Eventually though, the council member was killed in the presence of the Grand Inquisitor, making it that much easier to use her to lure in Jedi without the prospect of her escape. This leads us neatly into the Inquisitors themselves, as many of them had previous affiliations with the Jedi Order. So let's discuss the roster of the Inquisitorius that were once Jedi. The Grand Inquisitor, for instance, was a Jedi Temple Guard, and we know that he changed his allegiances after being empowered by Beresafi's speech during her trial. The Grand Inquisitor left the Order, and after the Empire rose, found himself a place alongside Vader as his primary enforcer. One of his most prestigious missions was the capturing of Force-sensitive children from an orphanage on the world of Gatine, but his efforts were eventually discovered and thwarted by fellow Order 66 survivor known as Kira Vantala, though little else is known about Vantala and where she currently is now. The Grand Inquisitor, though, is not the only Inquisitor to come from the Jedi Order, as most of the Inquisitors had previous allegiances to the Jedi. The Seventh Sister and Fifth Brother both occupied positions within the Jedi that we know and can confirm, though little is known about their previous lives before the rise of the Empire. We know that the Seventh Sister hails from the world Mirial and alludes to her training under Master Yoda, indicating that she was at least part of the initiate class of Jedi younglings. Likewise, the fifth brother of Artemisia alludes to his time under the Jedi, but doesn't give any confirmation as to his specific role or who his master may have been. The sixth brother, however, was once known as a Jedi by the name of Bill Valen, though the exact status of his story in canon is currently unknown. We say this because in Legends, before Tales of the Jedi was released, this was the Inquisitor that Ahsoka killed in order to obtain her white lightsabers. Ahsoka was able to purify these corrupted crystals and return them to a neutral state, though the Inquisitor from Tales of the Jedi does not seem to be the Jedi that was formerly known as Valen. Because of this, we cannot be certain as to whether or not Bill Valen's story is still canon, but we warranted mention nonetheless. The Tenth Brother, however, otherwise known as Prosset Dibs, is much more well known. Despite being blind, he was specifically chosen by Mace Windu to be a part of a covert operation team at the onset of the Clone War. Himself, Kit Fisto, and Risa Mano sought to uncover more information about the Separatist forces, which had recently declared war on the Republic. As the war escalated, the Jedi Master began to call out several members of the Order for their hypocrisy and blatant disregard for collateral damage during the times of war. Becoming frustrated very early on, Master Dibs even went as far as to physically assault Mace Windu when their conflict grew, and this resulted in a lightsaber duel in which Master Dibs was incapacitated and later put on trial for his crime. His philosophy wasn't outright malicious. In fact, the Jedi believed that the Order had a duty to rehabilitate those who strayed from the light, and at the time, before his fall to the dark side, had a more noble outlook on how to use the Force. When the Empire rose in place of the Republic, he found a new home alongside Vader's Inquisitors, being one of the few Jedi Masters to become an Inquisitor. We also know that the 13th Sister, formerly known as Iskat Ekaris, was one of a group to survive Order 66 before before ultimately becoming an Inquisitor herself. In the novel, Inquisitor, Rise of the Red Blade, we learn that her master, a Jedi by the name of Clef and Opus, was accompanying two other knights, Charlin Plaka and an unidentified Zeltron Jedi master when the Order was ultimately initiated. Shortly beforehand, however, they received orders from the Jedi Council to return to Coruscant, and they were actively in transit when the order was given, so they were not in the vicinity of clone troopers, nor were they in active war zone like many other Jedi were. The group was able to survive the initial attack, but within five years, they were hunted and executed by their former friend and now Inquisitor, Acarus. Acarus, who had given her allegiance to the Inquisitorius and was among the hunters to claim the life of Eeth Koth. 
but more on that in just a moment. Alongside Acherus and this crusade was fellow Inquisitor and close friend Talon Yaluna, who was also a Padawan during Order 66. Throughout the two of their tenures as Inquisitors, the two would become rather close and even question their allegiances to Lord Vader and the Empire. Eventually, the two Inquisitors decided to even launch an assassination attempt against their master Vader, although they would come short. And now we come to the Ninth Sister, also known as Masana Tide, who also fell victim to the allure of the Inquisitorius. And much like the Second Sister, she was pushed into the dark side by extreme torture at the behest of Sidious. Here, the Ninth Sister aided in the hunt for Jedi fugitives Cal Kestis and Farron Barr and underwent training from both the Grand Inquisitor and Lord Vader directly. And now we come to the Second Sister, featured prominently in Jedi Survivor, and Reva from Kenobi. The Second Sister, otherwise known as Trilla Sunduri, was a Padawan under Jedi Master Sher Junda, and was known for her brilliant intellect. Even as a Padawan, she showed a particular affinity for creative problem solving, which impressed her master. Both her and Junda did in fact survive the initial days of Order 66. After enduring the primary attack, they lived on the run for a few years before being captured, where Junda would eventually die in the year 9 BBY. Upon being taken prisoner, the second sister was subjected to extreme torture, torture which allowed Sinduri's hatred and anger to bubble violently to the surface. After awakening her darkest force powers, she was inducted into the ranks of the Inquisitorius and tasked with the hunting of Jedi survivors, becoming one of the Empire's more fearsome and aggressive predators. Reva, on the other hand, seems to have been too young to have a master of her own, as we see her in what appears to be general studies when the Order begins. While Reva worked as an Inquisitor for the duration of the next decade, her morals are up in the air as of right now. Not only did Reva survive a second attack by Darth Vader, but she appears to have renounced her dark side ways, and she's currently in the wind. It is unknown when we might expect to see Reva again, but it may not be as an Inquisitor at all. The final Inquisitor to mention in this line is the eighth brother, the Tyrellian Jango Jumper later turned dark side acolyte under Palpatine. For years, these Inquisitors were the premier Jedi executioners, responsible for the deaths of dozens of remaining Jedi Knights. On one particular quest, they were able to uncover an enclave of four Jedi survivors who had continued to stick together after the fall of the Republic. These friends, Jedi Knights Kondra, Musiso, Zubani Akaroni, and Nuj found refuge on Anuat after the Republic collapsed. After escaping the Order, they found the remains of an old Jedi shrine and set up camp for an undetermined amount of time, before eventually being found by the Inquisitors. When the Empire showed up, Musiso stayed behind in order to allow her friends the opportunity to escape, forming a last stand. While Kondra and Nuj were able to get away, the Inquisitors quickly tracked down Zubain Akaroni, who died on Matau as a result of the ensuing battle. Kondra and Nuj, however, were able to flee to the Burnin Khan, where Kondra's faith in the Jedi Order and sense of identity as a Jedi began to crumble. They continued to forge for basic survival resources before the Inquisitors finally tracked them down as well, slaying both Jedi at the Chromium Mine near Wickage, and their belongings were taken by the Inquisitors as trophies to place in their hall. Many of these Jedi were able to survive by being away from the battle when the Order was inactive, but while virtually any battleground during Order 66 immediately became deadly for Jedi, the epicenter of the attack lay in the Jedi Temple itself. Here, a newly christened Darth Vader marched on the remaining Jedi on Coruscant. Although in the temple on that fateful night, however, the youngling Grogu and Jedi Knight Keller and Beck, both of whom were able to make it out of the siege and avoid any direct confrontation with Vader. As the Jedi formerly known as Anakin marched through the halls of the temple, Beck was able to smuggle Grogu to some of his contacts, who boarded him onto a Naboo starfighter and took him off world. While we know that Grogu survived long past the reign of the Empire and will likely continue to live on for hundreds of years, we don't currently know the whereabouts of Master Beck. Since he was able to get off Coruscant, it's likely he was able to survive at least through the early days of the Empire, but his fate is not fully known as of now. Also in the temple that dreaded night was the youngling known by Vaso Tamaz. Tamaz, who used the sewer system to escape onto the streets of Coruscant unbeknownst to the clone troopers. Unable to get off world, however, he was captured by the Coruscant guard and one of their early inquisitors. But here something strange happened. 
the Inquisitor did not execute the young Jedi. Intrigued by the young Padawan's potential, the Inquisitor kept Tomas from being captured and began to teach him in the ways and methods of the dark side. Some Jedi, however, were not so lucky, and many were unable to survive for more than a few years. Once again in the Kenobi series, we were introduced to a Jedi by the name of Nari, who had been living in exile searching for a Jedi Master since the fall of the Republic. While little is known about Nari, we do know that he was able to identify General Kenobi, and he remained optimistic about the return of the Jedi. It was, however, his altruism that ultimately led to him exposing his Jedi powers to the Inquisitors, who had occupied Tatooine and ultimately led to his untimely death before Kenobi's very eyes. In fact though, the Kenobi series gave us a much closer look at not only Nari, but two other Jedi survivors who were only alluded to. While on the world of Mapuzo, Kenobi uncovers a secret underground network known as the Hidden Path. The path was designed to smuggle four sensitive individuals out of Imperial Reach, and here he finds a collection of names which all appear to be four sensitive individuals, or Order 66 survivors. Thanks to these carvings, we know that Quinlan Voss, Akira, Zonder, Drake Logan, and Rom Koda were smuggled through this path. Quinlan Voss, the Jedi renegade, was known for having a loose affiliation with the Council and their rules, much like Qui-Gon Jinn. Quinlan was unafraid to do what he felt was morally right over what the Jedi Code had dictated. Also on Kashyyyk when Order 66 was issued, Voss was ambushed and wounded by his clone forces, though he was able to strike down the clone commander Fey before getting off world to seek immediate medical attention, having been trapped on the jungle world for weeks. In canon, we know that Quinlan aided in the creation and the functionality of the Hidden Path. Quinlan was here. Yeah. He helps now and again. And was likely responsible for saving countless Force-sensitive individuals, including potentially Zonder, Akira, Drake Logan, and of course Rom Koda. Not much is known about these names, however, although we do know that the name Rom Koda is a reference to Star Wars The Force Unleashed and the Order 66 survivor from that game. While the Force Unleashed is no longer canon, it takes place between episodes 3 and 4. And since Coda's signature can be found carved into the wall of Mapuzo in the year 9 BBY, we can confirm that Coda did in fact survive in Legends and canon continuity. Similarly, Akira only has a limited appearance, showing up first in the Kenobi series and subsequently in Reversal of Fortune, where it was revealed that she had every intention of abandoning her Jedi heritage in order to live out the rest of her life in peace. With that said though, it is currently unknown the whereabouts of this Jedi. Zonder and Drake Logan have very little additional material to their name in Legends or Canon, and seem to be creations specifically for the show, but the Hidden Path is not the only underground railroad system for Jedi Knights to use after Order 66. On Coruscant, an individual by the name of Jax Pavin engineered one of the most advanced hidden maglev train systems in the galaxy in order to ferry political officials and persons of great importance across Coruscant. These individuals had in some way or another incurred the wrath of the Empire and needed to get off world as soon as possible. But Pavin, however, was one of the many Jedi who had been living in hiding since the outbreak of the Purge. As the former Padawan under Evan Peel and a close friend of Anakin Skywalker, Pavin survived by taking on the job of a private investigator, which allowed him to get close to targets closely affiliated with the Empire, and thus allowed him to know much more about their inner workings than the average citizen. He used these skills to join an organization known as Whiplash and began doing missions for the Rebellion before becoming one of the few people in the galaxy to deduce Darth Vader's true identity, discovering that he was the former Jedi Anakin Skywalker. Of all the people that Pavin helped, several were former Jedi, including Lara Nath Tarak and Nick Rostu. Tarak, the Twi'lek Knight, was on Coruscant when Order 66 was enacted, and the two ran into one another amidst the chaos of the Order. As they attempted to deduce what was going on, they used each other's skills to survive and escape underground while the temple before them burned under the weight of Vader's siege. Rostu, on the other hand, was a native of the world of Harun Kal, and one of the most prolific missions was the rescue and extraction of Mace Windu. Windu, who had been taken captive on his homeworld. With the aid of Master Balaba, the two were able to fight off the local militia and get Windu to safety. Rostu led the 44th Division throughout the Age of the Rebellion and led these brave soldiers across the galaxy during the war to liberate it, playing a key role in the resistance from the very early days of the Rebellion. 
Next, let's discuss the story of two survivors, Noaya Na and her close friend, Master Kai Hudora. When Order 66 occurred, the duo, alongside Na's Master Sims, found themselves on the world known as Tula. Here, Master Sims gave her life to offer Na and Hudora the opportunity to escape the forces of the Empire. Their fatal mistake, though, was their decision to return to Coruscant despite being actively hunted by the clones. In order to remain in hiding, Na cut her hair to appear as male, and was advised by Master Hudora to change her demeanor and behavior in order to blend in with Coruscant. When they arrived on the capital world, they encountered Jedi Knights Kofi Arana, Shadi Potkin, and Das Janir. The surviving Jedi intercepted the two of them and warned them not to return to the temple. After they all managed to get off world, Arana and Potkin would go on to join the Conclave of Kessel, but more on them in just a moment. Meanwhile, Jedi survivor Das Janir ventured far into the jungle, finding refuge with the Nosarians, who offered him a job and a place to stay safe. Other Order 66 survivors were able to sway entire worlds to their cause, and one particular Jedi by the name of Chona Bene was at the forefront of one such rebellion. After escaping to Vulcan with two other unnamed Jedi, he led the people in an uprising against the forces of the Empire. It was here, however, that he would not only confront Vader, but would be spared by him as well. Vader, walking away from the duel, rather than dying as a martyr and causing the world of Vulcan to become more sympathetic to the cause of the Jedi, Darth Vader elected to let Bene live as a failure in the eyes of the people that followed him. This actually turned the morale of the world against the Jedi, and led to them renouncing the ways of the Republic and embracing the Empire. One similar Jedi who graduated to a leadership position after the war was Jedi Master Ampanogios Brand, the former Padawan of Jedi Master Yaddle. Brand graduated to knighthood after the Battle of Naboo, and spent much of the next decade in service of the Jedi Order as a talented pilot. He fought during the First Battle of Geonosis, and led his troops to victory in the Battle of Basadoro before Order 66 was commenced. Shortly after the rise of the Empire, Vader shot down Brand's ship over the moon of Nar Shadda, where Brand crash-landed and was subsequently presumed dead by the Empire. Despite being severely injured, the Jedi was rescued by the Ganthan people, who fitted him with a prosthetic body, and he soon became known as the King of Ganna. The Jedi survived to see the dying days of the Empire, and even began to hear rumors of a new Jedi Academy led by the son of Skywalker, who he sought out and eventually would meet. The Jedi known as Nena Sendor, however, had a much deeper tie to not only the Premier Jedi Order, but the Cult of Revan. As a knight in the Clone Wars, Nea Sendor was sent to her homeworld of Demosis in the last year of the war, and it would be here that she discovered her family's connection to the Cult of Revan. Infatuated with the power that was promised, she killed her own master and joined the Cult, a cult which was still active in secret, unbeknownst to the rest of the galaxy. After Order 66 was executed, she fled from her homeworld upon realizing that she would soon be no match for Vader and his might. Fleeing to the world of Dantooine, where she met a scientist by the name of Aaron Jarson, and the two settled down and eventually had a son. Sendor, however, believed her son to be a reincarnation of Revan himself, and she then joined a New Republic starfighter after the Battle of Endor, becoming a new rebel herself. Next, let's discuss the story of Terran Malakos, who, like many, was attacked by his clones during Order 66. After slipping away, however, he was able to escape to the world of Dathomir, home of the Night Sisters and birthplace of Darth Maul. Once he landed on Dathomir, he was taken into captivity by the Knight Brothers and ultimately succumbed to his dark side urges. Ultimately, he turned to the dark side of the Force and began to manipulate the Knight Brothers against each other until he earned his freedom at which point he attempted to sway Cal Kestis to the allure of the dark side as well, offering him an apprenticeship role. Kestis himself was a Padawan during the Great Jedi Purge, and though his master, General Tipal, was one of the many Jedi casualties, he gave his life to that of Kestis so that he might live. He was able to board an escape pod from his cruiser and flee into the galaxy as a fugitive from the Empire, doing so at an incredibly young age with no contacts or guidance to aid him. While his Jedi training was largely incomplete, he was one of many who sought to train a new generation of knights, and in doing so, he began to learn about fellow Jedi survivor Enno Cordova. Cordova was able to create a holocron detailing the locations of several Force sensitives from across the galaxy, and was one of the architects of the Hidden Path. 
the very same underground network of spies and informants that Quinlan Voss helped to guide. Ultimately, he would meet his end by the hand of yet another Order 66 survivor by the name of Bode Akuna. After his tenure as a knight, Akuna became a bounty hunting gunslinger during the Age of the Empire, all but abandoning the way of the Jedi in order to become a rogue who bore no resemblance to the knight that he once was. He set down the way of the Jedi and sold his services to the highest bidder, eventually even starting a family funded by his criminal lifestyle. Bode eventually forged an uneasy pseudo-alliance arrangement with the Empire, where he would offer his services on a case-by-case -case basis. This eventually led him into conflict with Kestis and Cordova, ultimately leading to the death of the latter. Cordova, however, was not the only former Jedi that Kestis encountered during his life, but the next survivor falls into a bit of a gray area. We are talking, of course, about Dagan Gera who was actually a Jedi during the end of the High Republic era, 200 years before the start of the Clone War. During the prime of his life, Gera developed an obsession with the planet known as Tanalor, where he wished to create a new Jedi institution of his own design. The Council of this age, however, was not pleased with this idea, and after a conflict arose between the two, Gera eventually left the Order and pursued his own interests. Where the ambiguity comes in, however, is in the fact that Gera was sealed in a Bacta tank for the greater part of two centuries before being freed during the Imperial Era. He wasn't technically an active part of the Jedi when Order 66 was enacted, and hadn't served as a Jedi in almost 200 years. With that being said, we decided that he falls into the same category as Ahsoka, someone who retired, left the Order, or was otherwise inactive when Order 66 was commenced. Although Ahsoka was a part of the Republic, she no longer considered herself a Jedi, and therefore, we decided to count Gera as well. If Sidious had known about Gera's existence during the Siege of Nightfall, he almost certainly would have ordered his execution, and for that reason, we decided to count him. In a similar vein, falls the Jedi known as Nak Med, who also wasn't a formal part of the Order when the Republic fell, but was more of a retired Jedi. In the years leading up to the start of the Clone Wars, he elected to leave the Jedi Order in order to pursue a family of his own. In the early days of the Empire, Nak Med actually came to believe the Emperor's propaganda and wondered if the Jedi had truly attempted to stage a coup, though he would later come to learn the truth about his brethren. We decided to count him because even though he had retired from the way of the Jedi, he was still hunted by and even dueled the Grand Inquisitor. Though he was unable to kill the head of the Inquisitorius, the former Jedi was able to break his lightsaber and escape with his life. He then found himself a new home on Palm Ba, where he would live out the remainder of his life, even passing down his robes and lightsaber to his great-grandson, who later became an avid collector of Force-related artifacts and stories. One additional Jedi who is far older than most was the Jedi known as Beldorian, one of the only Hut Jedi to ever be inducted into the Order. Beldorian was first initiated nearly 400 years before the rise of the Empire, and in 400 BBY, he had his first encounter with the Dark Side. While on the world of Teselda, he became enamored with the power of the darkness, and soon after, walked away from the Order in pursuit of the way of a Dark Jedi, his own nefarious goals. He would only meet his end in the year 13 ABY in a duel with Leia Organa Solo, long after the rise and fall of Palpatine and the scourge of Vader. While Nakhmed was a much more seasoned and experienced Jedi Knight, we know that several Padawans were able to survive while the clones targeted their Jedi Masters. And among the Padawans in the Order's final class was Gungi, one of the very rare Wookiee Jedi that we've seen in the Star Wars mythos. While we only know of Gungi's whereabouts in the first year or so after the Empire rose, we can confirm that he did in fact survive the Siege of Nightfall and the Rise of the Empire. Gungi, so far as we know though, hasn't had a direct run in with Darth Vader. Otherwise, he most certainly would have perished, and Gungi is not the only Jedi Padawan to have survived the Purge. Several younglings were able to escape in a manner of different ways, but many were protected from the Order thanks to the aid of Jedi Master Kakrook. On the world of Bogdan III, Kakrook and Master Jessiel met with a Jedi Master by the name of Duman, and with the Jedi Master was a group of excited younglings. The three Jedi, Padawan Chase Peru, and several younglings were in transit when Order 66 was enacted. With the four seasoned Jedi immediately leaping into action to protect the young children, the Jedi fought to escape the cruiser with Masters Mon and Jessiel giving their lives in the process. Kakrook and Puru, however, were able to get the four younglings to safety 
adding six survivors to the list. The six of them crashed on a wild, unspoiled moon where they had to regroup and build themselves into a method of survival. The names of the younglings under the protection of Kakrook were as follows, Ken and Tanzir, Sidiwa, Jeno, and Sidiri. Here, they came into conflict with a local pirate colony led by Captain Lumbra and eventually fled to Arkinia, a world where they rendezvoused with Jedi Master Zhao. Master Zhao took the children under his wing, taught them daily sessions as they hid from the Empire, and trained them in the Jedi arts, while Jedi Master Kakrook and Chase Piru focused on their survival and keeping them hidden. They even went so far as to create a hidden temple for themselves, though Kakrook eventually decided it was best to part ways from the younglings so as to not put a target on their back. Eventually, Kakrook even joined Luke Skywalker's new Jedi Order long after the rise and fall of the Empire. This makes Kakrook a member of the highly exclusive club, that being Order 66 survivors, who then went on to aid in the construction of a new Jedi Order. But more on that in just a moment. Now that we've reached the halfway point of our Order 66 survivors, we'd like to take a moment to show off something special that we've been working on and thank today's sponsor, Ona Saber. So please enjoy. We hope you all enjoyed, and now, let's get back to the survivors. Luke's Academy also crossed paths with a Jedi Master by the name of Aquinos, who led a legion known as the Iron Knights. In the Clone Wars, Master Aquinos was labeled as a heretic for his unruly blend of technology and traditional Jedi practices. His Iron Knight Legion augmented their own physical bodies with droid exosuits, much like General Grievous did. The Council, however, found this to be egregious and banished the Jedi from the Order, allowing him to take refuge from Order 66 and ultimately survive past the rise of the Empire. This makes Master Aquinos one of the very few to ever survive in all three generations of the main Star Wars timeline, making him yet another member of this exclusive group. In fact, there are quite a few individuals that survived not only the rise of the Empire, but its fall as well. Some of these Jedi are known for being hundreds or even thousands of years old, so let's discuss a few of these members. The first Jedi was one of Mace Windu's former masters by the name of Terra Sa. Master Sa is one of the most long-lived Jedi Knights of the Order, and due to her netty physiology, she perceived time much differently than most Jedi. Despite her long lifespan, however, she developed an attraction to fellow Jedi Master Thome, and the two sought to develop a relationship with one another during the Clone Wars conflict. On Nar Shadda, when the Order was inactive, they were able to flee to the world of Kashyyyk in order to build a life together. Though Thom would soon meet his end not long after the rise of the Empire, Sa did survive the initial onslaught of Order 66, and Thom did as well, which warrants him being mentioned here today. Terra Sa, however, would go on to assist Luke Skywalker in building his new Jedi Academy, and wouldn't die until the year 138 ABY, long after even Luke himself had passed into the Force. One further Jedi who had lived an incredibly long life was Master Vima Daboda, who was already 10,000 years old when the Great Jedi Purge commenced. Master Daboda lived an extremely illustrious life, facing down her own daughter who had turned to the dark side, and even crossed paths with some of the most famous Jedi of the modern era. She helped grant Obi-Wan Kenobi and the infant Luke Skywalker safe passage to Tatooine after all of Kenobi's resources had been stripped away by the Empire. After the Purge, the Jedi Master hid away on the densely populated world of Nar Shadda, which helped to conceal her presence in the Force. Over the years, she crossed paths with Han Solo, who was held prisoner on Kessel, and even passed down her lightsaber to Leia Organa Solo. Perhaps one of the most significant years of Daboda's life were spent after the Empire itself fell, after she went a great distance to help the Skywalker family find their foothold in a newly liberated galaxy. And now, we have reached one of my favorite survivors in Luke's battlemaster, Morin Thar. 
Master Thar was a particularly aggressive knight who ascended to the rank of Master near the onset of the Clone Wars in the year 22 BBY. During the Outer Rim sieges, Master Thar found himself on Zegris and found its murky swamplands to be advantageous to his survival. Much like Master Yoda did with Dagobah, Master Thar was able to hide himself and his Force presence among such a particularly powerful planet. In fact, he didn't even know the Empire had fallen until the year 10 ABY, and when the Jedi Master did eventually come out of hiding, he was welcomed into Luke Skywalker's new Jedi Order. Master Thar ascended again to the rank of Battle Master under Luke's leadership, and taught the new recruits popper lightsaber technique. Interestingly, when Thar joined Luke's new order, he found that several of his peers from back in the day had also become founding members. One such founder went by the name of Xanus Baron, who was not only the next direct successor to the title of Grand Master after Luke, but was Thar's apprentice back in the day. After Luke died at the end of the Imperial Sith War, Baron ascended to the rank of Grand Master and took control of the Jedi Order. During the Clone Wars, he passed the Jedi Trials and graduated to knighthood, and was stationed on Waldis to oversee the Jedi Academy with fellow knight and close friend Donrath Remker. When Order 66 was issued, the clone forces eviscerated the Academy with an AT-AT walker, killing everyone inside and presuming that Baron and Remker to be among the casualties. Due to Waldis's remote nature, the Empire never took any particular interest in the planet, allowing both Baron and Remker to remain there for the duration of the Imperial regime. Another one of Thar's personal friends was Ty Nomante, who graduated to knighthood just two years ahead of Thar and Anakin. What makes Nomante interesting, however, was his distrust for clone troopers, who had failed to protect his apprentice and who had died during the Clone Wars. Much like the Jedi Rom Koda, this Jedi elected to work with the militias and local militaries rather than with the troopers, which of course greatly aided in his survival when Order 66 was enacted. When the Empire eventually fell, they were welcomed into Luke Skywalker's new Jedi Order alongside several other founding members, including Kro Sadun and Vansar Noden. Kro Sadun was a fellow founding member of the New Jedi Order, and would secede Baron as Grand Master after his death in the year 41 ABY. Taken and trained as a Jedi Initiate until the age of 12, Kro Sadun found an apprenticeship under Jedi Master Roth Del Masona within just a few short years of the invasion of Naboo. After the outbreak of the Clone Wars, he was designated as a Jedi General in the Grand Army of the Republic, though he only graduated to knighthood during the last year of the Clone Wars. When the Chancellor was abducted, however, Sadun's master, Del Mosana, lost his life attempting to defend Palpatine, and Sadun was driven to ground shortly thereafter. At the time, Vansar Noden was still a Jedi Padawan and was training at the Academy on Hal Roth. Noden was consistently bullied by his peers at the academy, and on one fateful day, their insults got so bad that Noden had to actively flee into the forest in order to compose himself. After pulling himself together, he returned to find the academy in utter ruins, having fallen victim to the events of Order 66. His classmates had all but perished, leaving Noden as the sole survivor of the academy. With no way of getting off world, he instead elected to live as a hermit in the woods, feeding off of the local wildlife and abstaining from social contact for more than two decades. Long before this, however, Vader spent his life hunting and butchering the Jedi who even aspired to make it to this point. One of Vader's most iconic battles was with Jedi survivor Eeth Koth, who spent his life training as a Jedi Guardian and serving in the Clone Wars as a friend of Skywalker. In the aftermath of the war, Eeth Koth retired away from the Jedi Order and he even settled down with his wife named Mira, foregoing the Jedi path. The two had a child, and Koth himself found a new profession as a priest in the Outer Rim world. Eeth Koth lived in relative peace while the shadow of the Empire loomed large, being one of the few Jedi Council members to escape, along with Yoda and Kenobi. When Eeth Koth was ultimately tracked down by Darth Vader and a team of Inquisitors, he pleaded with the Dark Lord to spare his life. He claimed that he was a Jedi no longer, and asked Vader to be merciful. Vader, of course, did not oblige, and following a ferocious duel that eviscerated the town square, Eeth Koth met his end by Vader's blade after putting up a formidable and highly admirable fight. Shortly after the execution of the council member, we can see a holographic list of remaining Order 66 survivors that includes the likes of Master Coleman Kajar and Oppo Rancisis. With this being in canon, both former High Council members who were presumed dead during Order 66. Alongside these names on the Inquisitor's hit list, we can see the names of Jedi veterans such as Ka Moon Kohli, 
and Selrak Iluos, but very little is known about either of these Jedi and how they survived Order 66. But what we do know is that they were firmly in Vader's sight at this point in the timeline. In the years leading into 9 BBY, however, Master Kaja was executed by the Inquisitors, and his body was left in tomb and resin on the moon of Nur in the Mustafar system, putting an end to another Jedi Master. The fate of Opo Rancisis, however, has never been officially revealed, and we are as of yet uncertain when he died due to conflicting accounts, but this list hints that he was still alive by the execution of Eeth Koth in the year 14 BBY, unlike in Legends when Opo Rancisis was killed by the Dark Jedi Sora Bolk. Alongside Master Kaja in the Resin Tomb, however, was the body of fellow Jedi Masters Terra Sanube and Valerie Tide. Sanube first began his adventures as a Jedi during the era of the High Republic and was one of the oldest Jedi Masters during the Clone Wars. Right now, we cannot confirm exactly when or how Master Sanube died, but the placement of his body does give us some clues regarding the circumstances of his death. The resin vessel on Nur acted as a sort of trophy hall for the Inquisitors, indicating that Master Sanube had been executed by a member of their ranks and not by the clones. If this is true, then it would indicate that he survived the initial onslaught and was alive for the rise of the Inquisitor forces. While we cannot say for certain that he did survive Order 66, the fact that he is in this tomb seems to hint that it's a likely possibility, which at least warrants a small mention. Valerie Tide, also entombed in resin, attempted to hide her identity from the Empire as long as she could before being eventually tracked down and located on the world of Athio III, where she was captured and later executed for her previous affiliation with the Jedi. Among the rest of Vader's victims throughout the Purge were the likes of Farron Barr, Farron was an Iktachi Jedi who took up a far darker approach to knighthood during his time on the run. After the rise of the Empire, he sought to not only simply overthrow them, but to avenge the previous order through violence and bloodshed. His methods were far more extreme than the average Jedi. As an advisor to the late King Li Char of the Mon Calamari, he used his political influence to instigate unrest between the Mon Calamari and the Empire, doing so in order to stir conflict and incite further rebellion. He used the Mon Calamari to send a message to the Empire's oppressive regime and the rest of the captive galaxy at large. When the Empire responded, however, they sent their greatest Jedi executioner, that being, of course, Lord Vader himself. And even this Jedi maverick, such as Farron Barr, was unable to contend with Vader's superior combat prowess. He died in battle when Vader arrived, and Vader enacted his vengeance on the Mon Calamari for their hubris. While Barr was a notable trophy for Vader to add to his wall, one of the most notorious achievements was dominating the Conclave on Kessel. The Conclave was an assembly of eight Order 66 survivors led by Jedi Master Sade Potkin, and these eight seasoned survivors elected to confront Darth Vader and attempt to kill him in his early days of Sithood. The seven Jedi to follow Master Potkin on this endeavor were Su Choi, Kofi Arana, Sai Lan Wes, Boltar Swan, Makis Shalas, Roblio Darte, and Jastis Far. While these Jedi were very powerful, this is one of the most notorious Jedi massacres of the entire Imperial era. Leaking to Vader that Obi-Wan Kenobi would be present there, Vader ventured to Kessel, where he would systematically and one by one ultimately kill and massacre all eight Jedi survivors. Nonetheless, all of these Jedi managed to escape Order 66. One Jedi Master who was able to give Vader a substantial fight was former Master Karak Infala. As a Jedi, Infala was known as a master combatant who could contend with the very best duelists of his time before he took what is known as the Barash Vow. The Barash Vow forbade him from interacting with the rest of the Order and sent him into exile as a form of penance. This allowed the Jedi to escape execution since he was not in active combat during Order 66. Karak Infala was one of the very few opponents to actually cause Vader to retreat. When he confronted the Dark Lord, he threw him from a cliffside after a fierce duel, rendering Vader's suit almost non-functional. Despite Vader's injuries and the damage done to his life support system, he was able to escape in order to make the necessary repairs. Upon returning, Vader adopted a different tactic, massacring the civilians of a nearby town below in order to capitalize on Infala's compassion. He broke the dam to instigate a flood, which preoccupied Infala as he attempted to stop the city from enduring the flood's destruction. And it was at this point that Vader captured Infala's lightsaber. Physically, Infala is more than a match for Vader at this time, 
but Vader's utter remorsefulness brought him to his knees where he struck a bargain. He begged Vader to take his life in exchange for the innocents, and in a fury, Vader killed them both, using the Force to snap Infala's neck. Infala's ability to survive a duel with the great Darth Vader is something that not many Jedi can say they've done, but one who shares this experience is a Jedi Knight by the name of Ferris Olin. Much like a few other Order 66 survivors on this list, Olin survived by abandoning the Jedi Order before Order 66, having disagreed with several knights regarding the strict nature of the Jedi Code. As a member of the same graduating class that produced Anakin, Olin worked for several years as a loyal knight before turning his back on his friends and the Order. After leaving, he took up forgery, creating fake documents for criminals who needed them, and this gave him an immediate leg up in surviving Order 66 and the following Purge. Not only was he not within the vicinity of any clones, but he had automatic access to a brand new identity and paperwork to get him off world. One fellow friend of his was likewise able to escape was the Jedi Master Garen Mole who only received the rank of Master within the last year of the Clone Wars. His final assignment as the war was to the world of Achirin, where he was tasked with negotiating a ceasefire when Order 66 was enacted. It was these Separatist enemies, however, that helped the Jedi escape the clone army who had turned on them both, and helped get Master Molin off-world. Molin would flee to the world of Ilum, where he would reconvene with fellow survivor Phytor Anna, who told him about the destruction of the Jedi Temple and fall of the Council. The two Jedi remained here in exile for the first year of the Empire's control, before being found by Jedi Olin. Olin, who had informed them that Master Kenobi had also survived the Purge. Suffering from malnutrition, the group elected to leave Ilum in pursuit of the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. While Olin was extremely intelligent, he too was able to survive an encounter with Vader, though while Infala caused Vader to retreat, Olin was not so powerful. Ferris Olin barely escaped with his life, and he eventually came into contact with Luke's new Jedi Order after going on the run for more than 20 years. After meeting Luke though, Ferris Olin would again embrace the teachings of the Jedi and become a Jedi Master. At the Academy, we also meet Ikrit, who is a fellow Order 66 survivor and one of the oldest Jedi known from all across the galaxy. Ikrit was a former student under Yoda, who put himself in exile nearly 400 years before the Separatist movement, and they were able to survive simply because the modern Jedi knew virtually nothing about his existence, and many believed Ikrit was dead. Due to his age and historical understanding, he was able to enlighten Luke's new Jedi Order regarding the history of the galaxy and the previous mistakes of the former Order, ensuring that Luke's Academy was a far stronger and more well-rounded network than that of the Republic-era Jedi. While Infala is one of the strongest physical warriors within the Order, and perhaps one of the most capable of taking on Vader in single combat, knights like Ikrit and Olin prioritize intellect and mental fortitude. They, however, are not alone. And now, we'll move on to Order 66 survivors who were extremely intelligent and used this to survive. Another Jedi of this philosophy was Kazdan Partis, who loved building machines and was a better mechanic than any other Jedi. Like many of the knights, he was at the temple when the order was given, but unlike other Jedi, Master Kazdan fled the scene rather than staying and stand his ground to fight. This guilt began to plague Kazdan as soon as he arrived on Raxus Prime, his torment of regret slowly driving him insane. In his insanity, he created a full replica of the Jedi Temple and the Jedi Council out of garbage that he found on the world. But Master Kazdan was not the only Jedi who fled from the Temple that night. Several Jedi academics were among the most productive survivors, and several of them stole knowledge and secrets before they could be destroyed or captured by the Empire. Such as in canon, immediately after Order 66, Jedi Librarian Jocasta Nu and her assistant Gar sought to protect the secrets of the Jedi Order. Jocasta was able to capture a holocron detailing records of Force-sensitive children from across the galaxy, stopping it from falling into the hands of Vader. The two were then able to reconstruct a clandestine Jedi library where secrets would remain safe from the prying eyes of the Sith. While Jocasta herself was later executed by Vader, Gar remained posted in the hideaway for years after the fall of the Empire. However, one fateful day, he decided to detonate the entrance, burying himself alongside the secrets of the Ancient and Lost Order. 
but the teachings would not be lost forever. In the year 6 ABY, Luke Skywalker would come across the school, using the holocrons to aid in the reconstruction of his own new Jedi Order. As the years went on, there were less and less Jedi, and even Vader himself grew close to the end of his life. In fact, the very last Jedi to be killed by Vader before his duel with Obi-Wan was a Jedi Master by the name of Anya Kuro. Jedi Master Anya Kuro was a particularly unorthodox, yet highly devoted Jedi who developed a tendency to integrate darker practices into her teachings and training, channeling her own latent aggression and malicious thoughts into her abilities. Contrary to popular belief, Mace Windu was not the only Jedi to utilize a purple lightsaber during the era of the Republic, as Jedi Master Kuro also developed a purple kyber crystal due to her more aggressive tendencies and harsher practices. Once Order 66 commenced, she escaped to the world of Kofring 5, returning to the site where she had previously been imposed on exile. A self-imposed exile, she had previously spent 12 years in the part of the galaxy during her hiatus from the Jedi Order, and Anya was intimately familiar with this particular system, which allowed her to adapt much more easily to a new environment than most Jedi. It was here where she lived as a hermit for the duration of the Galactic Empire's reign, existing in isolation for the greater part of two decades until the Emperor's Hand, Mara Jade, was able to track down the aged Jedi Master. Despite Mara Jade locating Anya Kuro, Vader insisted on dueling her personally. When Vader arrived, their lightsabers did not clash immediately, as the two shared a philosophical conversation about the nature of evolution and extinction. And though Anya had largely resigned herself to death, she still elected to duel Vader. After pinning Kuro beneath a tree following a lengthy engagement, Vader executed the last Jedi that he would kill before his duel with Obi-Wan Kenobi aboard the first Death Star bringing an end to the Jedi Purge. While Darth Vader was the one to defeat several Jedi survivors, the knight known as Ashrod Het actually found himself defeated by none other than Obi-Wan Kenobi. As a native to Tatooine, Het felt a great tremor in the Force when the order was given, and he believed himself to be the sole survivor of the Jedi. Asherod Het was extremely powerful and was able to defeat all but one of his clone troopers, and the final clone trooper he kept hostage in order to interrogate with Het being one of the few Jedi to fight his way out of the Purge. In the years following the Order, Het returned to his homeworld of Tatooine, where he joined the ranks of the Tusken Raiders in his old heritage, as he then began leading pillages across Mos Eisley and even attacking the Lars homestead, which garnered the attention of the Jedi Master Kenobi. When the two Jedi confronted one another, it was ultimately Kenobi who came out victorious. By this point in galactic history, very few survivors of the original Jedi Order which reigned during the Republic were left alive. Most were long dead or far beyond their physical limits. But now we reach two Jedi in canon that not only survived the fall of the Empire, but lived to see the rise of the First Order. These two Jedi are named Mil Albieth and Ververt Stack. Albieth in particular had a peculiar sensitive perception of empathy through the Force, and was able to potently feel the emotions of those around her. Her emotional connection to others had grown so powerful that she actively got nauseous in violent scenarios or while discussing difficult topics. For a time, the Jedi attempted to cut herself off from the Force in order to alleviate this constant pressure, but eventually she found that she could put it to good use as a Jedi medic and spiritual advisor. When they were children during the first days of the war, their initiate class was scheduled to venture to the world of Ilum for the gathering ceremony, and her fellow initiates spoke excitedly about the blades that they'd create and how they'd use them to combat the Separatist forces. Some of the discussion, however, led Albieth to feeling queasy and ultimately needing to abandon the trip at the very last minute. The rest of her class, however, went to Ilum to complete the gathering, and within three short years, the rest of them were all presumed dead as a result of Order 66, likely killed on Ilum. While she and Stag were mere younglings when the Order was commenced, a Jedi by the name of Master Uvel was one of the most decorated Jedi veterans of the era, noted for his bravery in combat and affinity for history. Upon surviving the first wave of the Purge, Master Uvel became fearful that Palpatine would seek to not only destroy the Jedi as an order, but also destroy its histories. Much like Jocasta knew, he feared the destruction of several sacred Jedi artifacts and sought to protect as much of the Jedi's history as possible. 
For this, he turned to the smuggler by the name of Antron Batch, who had done dealings with the Jedi Order before the Purge. He entrusted to Batch all that he had, which included a ship full of scrolls, holocrons, lightsabers, and other sacred Jedi artifacts. And with this, Batch went into hiding on the abandoned Geonosian outpost. We don't currently know how long after Order 66 Master Uvel survived, but given his advanced age and mastery of the Jedi arts, it's entirely probable that he met his end by natural causes rather other than being hunted to extinction. While we can't be certain as to whether or not Master Uvel lived to see the end of the Empire, we do know that the Jedi Balin Skull certainly did. First featured in the Ahsoka trailer, newcomer Balin is an original addition to Disney canon, and right now, not much is known about him other than the fact that he once knew Anakin Skywalker, and of course has abandoned the Jedi way. Described as an Order 66 survivor who turned to freelance assassin work, the full extent of Balin and how he survived is likely to be detailed in the upcoming Ahsoka series. His apprentice, though, in Shin Haiti, doesn't seem to have been a member of the original Jedi Order. Shin is likely too young to have been around during the fall of the Republic, and it's entirely likely that she was a Force-sensitive civilian who Balin encountered or even some have theorized that she may be a clone, but yet again, this remains to be seen. Also in regards to the Ahsoka series, we want to discuss the character of Barriss Offee. As of right now, Barriss has not been confirmed to be a survivor of Order 66, and in fact, it's widely accepted that she most likely perished during the Jedi Purge. There have been whispers, however, about her inclusion in the upcoming Ahsoka series, but please understand that these are just rumors right now and cannot be verified. Without a canon case of her death, however, it's possible that she did in fact survive the fateful order. But with this, we now enter a gray area in the Disney canon. As in an unreleased comic, we see the Jedi Master Ayla Sakura in Shock T. Ayla Sakura's death in particular seemed to be pretty definitive, as we saw her being gunned down by her armada of clone troopers in Revenge of the Sith. Shock T's death has also been confirmed to have occurred at the hand of Anakin Skywalker during Operation Nightfall, and although it's very likely that the new comic is simply hinting at a vision, we at least wanted to mention it here. In Legends, however, Shock T would survive Order 66, and would even take on an apprentice of her own by the name of Maris Brood. Shock T, however, was hunted down by Starkiller well into the reign of the Empire, eventually being killed by him. Maris Brood, however, eventually slipped into the clutches of the Dark Side, before she too was defeated by Starkiller. Since Brood was technically a Padawan of the Old Order, however, she counts as an Order 66 survivor. Another important mention is that the main Jedi Temple on Coruscant is not the only Jedi outpost present in the galaxy, and it's time to discuss the temple known as the Almas Academy. Originally formed in the year 119 BBY, the Almas Council was designed to oversee a smaller subsect of students after the Dark Jedi conflict. And as it grew, instructors began to redesign the academy for their own purposes. The academy was founded by Master Nera Saviri, and later led by the Jedi Lanius Quelbertuk. Several members of this academy also survived Order 66. It's important to know that in the time leading up to Order 66, they were under siege by a band of pirates that all but eradicated the monastery. However, the pirates did not claim the lives of everyone involved, as Master Ashok Boda, for one, was a revered member of the Jedi Library and was a well-studied academic, someone who survived the Purge. One of his prized possessions was a holocron once belonging to Master Bodo Bas, and when Order 66 was enacted, he ensured the safeguard of this holocron with his life. He would later go on to join forces with other surviving members of the Almas Council, including the Jedi Halagad Ventor. Ventor made headway in the construction of a refugee camp for Jedi, trying to establish a safe haven before being captured in Legends by the lead Inquisitor, Jarek. Jarek, who was a former Jedi Knight who had turned tail after Order 66. Within this refugee camp, he provided safe haven to Jedi such as the Jedi Kai Justice and Valen Draco before being captured. During Boda's interrogation, however, which ultimately broke him, and Vader soon set on the trail of these Jedi survivors and the secret conclave. Of this group, only the Jedi Ku Ran was able to escape Vader's wrath. 
Inquisitor Jarek, however, had his own legion of seven Dark Jedi, all of them serving as his personal enforcer. One of these Dark Jedi, Ma, was a former Jedi Knight who survived the initial events of Order 66 and should also be counted on this list. As the shadow of the Empire loomed, dark forces began to infect the galaxy, and even Vader himself took on a new apprentice. This leads us directly to Starkiller, however, formerly known as the Force-sensitive Galen Merrick. While Galen himself was not a part of the Jedi Order when Order 66 was enacted, his parents most certainly were. The Jedi Knights Mali and Kento Merrick were loyal servants of the Jedi before developing feelings for one another, feelings which eventually culminated in a relationship. Much like Anakin and Padme, they married in secret and kept their relationship from the Jedi Council before going into self-imposed exile before Order 66. This allowed them for a time to raise their son on Kashyyyk in peace. For a time, they successfully evaded the Empire in Order 66. However, Mali would later come to be killed by Trandoshan slavers in an attempt to protect the Wookiees that had offered them sanctuary. Kento Merrick was then left to raise their son alone, and he would go on to survive 10 years into the reign of the Empire. Eventually, though, Merrick's luck ran out, and Lord Vader conducted an invasion on Kashyyyk, where Kento was once again forced into action. For one final moment, he embraced his identity as a Jedi and faced Vader in single combat, only to die at the hands of the Dark Lord. Vader, who then took Galen under his wing as his own secret acolyte of the dark side of the Force. And that leaves us with just two Jedi left. Our penultimate Jedi is not someone who is often considered when discussing survivors of Order 66. And that Jedi, my friends, is Anakin Skywalker. Shortly preceding the execution of Order 66, Skywalker fully gave in to the identity of Lord Vader, cementing himself as a harbinger of darkness and an agent of the Emperor. However, Vader's final duel with Luke Skywalker in the Emperor's throne room showed that while Anakin seemed to have been all but gone, there was still a sliver of the Jedi Knight still remaining. Anakin, in his final moments of strength, was able to defeat Darth Vader, usurp the Emperor, and bring about an age of peace from a fallen regime. To us, Anakin Skywalker would also count as a survivor of the Order, albeit one that lied dormant for decades following the Jedi's downfall. So then, after all these survivors, who is left? The final Jedi we'd like to talk about today is the immortal icon, Jedi Bob. Jedi Bob has served as a cornerstone of the Jedi Order for years, and the Order would cease to exist without his intervention. Not only is Jedi Bob a survivor of Order 66, but is effectively immortal. What better way to close out this comprehensive list of Order 66 survivors than with one of the most powerful Jedi to have ever lived? But anyway, my friends, what do you think of this list? Are there any Jedi that we missed in our Order 66 survivors? If you've made it this far, we thank you immensely for visiting our archives. Thank you so much for the support also on such a large undertaking and a large holocron. As always, my friends and acolytes of the Force, may the Force be with you always, and I hope that you have an amazing day.